professor of neurology and director of the Ataxia Center at the UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles. Welcome, Dr. Perlman. Thank you so much for inviting me back, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and I guess if there's any audio problems, you know, somebody will let, you know, the team know and, and we can try to reset, but so far so good. So we've already begun to get some questions posted. Um, what, the first one is from Harriet, who has SCA3 diagnosed nine years ago um, and has, a, you know, apparently regular visits, but concerned about apparent lack of circulation and numbness in fingers and toes, which are very cold sensitive. They turn blue. Um, and the podiatrist um, who's been seeing Harriet said that this is normal for somebody who has neuropathy. And in SCA3, you can have peripheral neuropathy as well as the central ataxia symptoms. So Harriet has noticed lately that hands and toes are beginning to swell. Um, and should she contact someone before her regular appointment in June? Um, so the puffiness and swelling that people get with peripheral neuropathy can be a result of the small nerves not giving adequate signals to the blood vessels. So they don't circulate properly and you can get some mild swelling. On the other hand, if the swelling is noticeable, not just a little bit of puffiness, if it doesn't go away overnight when you're lying down and your feet are elevated, or if it's associated with pain, um, you probably should see someone before your June appointment. Um, there's always a risk not associated with your ataxia of potentially blood clots or an infection that could be contributing and would be treated very specifically. John has a question about thoughts and indications for using duloxetine in ataxia. So I know that there are several drugs that have been used off label um, in research labs in the ataxic animals um, that seem to be helpful on a genetic level. Duloxetine, I believe, is only used symptomatically. It's approved for pain management. It's also an antidepressant. And I most often use it in somebody who is having pain, myofascial pain, neuropathic pain. Um, but if you look at the potential side effects, um, it can cause fatigue, it can cause dizziness, it can cause um, sleepiness or it can impair your sleep at night. It can cause twitches. It can um, have a variety tremor. So there are a variety of side effects of duloxetine that need to be monitored in you know, anybody, but especially somebody with ataxia. Now, Cynthia has an interesting question. Should a person with a genetically inherited ataxia donate blood or donate organs? Um, most of the genetic ataxias do not affect the health of your blood or the health of you know, regular organs. Um, there are certainly some ataxic disorders that are associated with um, anemia or associated with um, heart problems, or associated with a risk of diabetes. Um, and you know these are things like Friedreich's ataxia and others. So if you have a genetic ataxia that affects one of the organs you would like to donate, whether it's blood or an internal organ, um, you know, that could be a problem and, and you should not donate. But for the most part, you know, the genetically inherited ataxias affect the nervous system. They affect the brain, the cerebellum, peripheral nerves, spinal cord, um, and you know should not uh, interfere with your um, interest in donating blood. There's an anonymous attendee who asks if the feeling of heavy legs is common in ataxia. Um, they say they can only walk for a minute or so at a time and then they tire out. And they have spinocerebellar ataxia type eight. So with ataxia, coordinating legs, coordinating arms can be, you know, very fatiguing. 
Um, it takes more effort, um, more mental effort, and also more physical effort to make your legs go where you need them to go. So fatiguing is common and respecting that, you know, with your planned activities to allow for that. Now, other things that can give you a sense of heavy legs, if you have a change in muscle tone in your legs, which can accompany some ataxias, um, you know, where the, the muscles are stiff or they're rigid, that can make them feel heavy and harder to move and harder to coordinate. Or if there is a peripheral neuropathy associated with your ataxia, you know, the change in nerve um, powering the muscle or sensation can also make the legs feel heavy. So with any ataxia, um, ataxia type eight, you know, is typically um, just an ataxic disorder with minimal involvement of other pathways. But, you know, you should have your doctor check to see if there's spasticity, if there's rigidity, if there's a neuropathy that is contributing to the heavy legs that could be treated and then make the legs easier to, to move. Another anonymous attendee, what is the role of physical therapy in treating ataxia type six? Well, I think we know from prior um, webinars and, and certainly a lot of the information available on the National Ataxia Foundation website that physical therapy always helps. Um, it helps develop a home exercise program, which can work on core strength, balance exercises, strengthening or stretching if there's muscle involvement. So that for anybody with ataxia, including SCA6, improving core strength, improving balance with the help of a physical therapist can you know, greatly improve your day-to-day -day activity level. Um, they can also help you develop a good home exercise program, which can include cardio, rhythmic, repetitive exercise. They can work with you on strategies to help control tremor. So, you know, I think, you know, a physical therapist is a good partner to have with any treatment program. Now, Chris has a question about the benefits of trehalos. Intravenous trehalose um, has been uh, has had a, a clinical trial ongoing, which is paused right now, and it was specifically targeting spinal cerebellar ataxia type three. So that the intravenous trehalose, which bypasses the stomach so it doesn't get digested, is felt to get into the nerve pathways where there's a buildup of an abnormal protein, protein aggregates in the spinal cerebellar ataxias breaks up the aggregates and enables the nerve to clear the abnormal protein that has been building up and compromising nerve function. Now there's a group in Malaysia that has been working with oral trehalose, hoping that with a high enough dose, you can get enough absorbed that it won't all be digested. You'll get enough trehalose into your system through the oral route, and then it'll go to the brain and do the same thing. But my impression is that the doses of oral trehalose you have to use to get enough into the brain to make a difference could really upset the stomach. Kay has a question about downbeat nystagmus. Um, what do you try and in what order? Well, I have a long list of medications that I have used over the years for downbeat nystagmus or nystagmus of any type. So with nystagmus, um, the drugs that you know, seem to have the highest profile of being helpful. Um, Foraminopyridine or dalfampridine um, has been helpful for nystagmus, dizziness, and to some extent ataxia. Um, baclofen can be helpful with some causes of nystagmus, and there are a variety of other medicines which I believe are listed on the National Ataxia Foundation website. They have an information sheet that can provide more information. But I will usually start with um, dalfampridine. That, that's usually my go-to drug. You know, excuse me one minute. Somebody's knocking on my door. Is it, is it ready yet? Yeah, can you just email me so I can reviewed it so I have the timestamp? Okay, perfect. Good. Thank you. All right. I have a patient who's having a procedure done, and I have to let them know that her blood work is okay to go ahead with the procedure. Let me quickly check that. And, you know, this is called multitasking. 
and her blood work is good, so she will go ahead and have her procedure done. And I apologize for this little interruption. Okay, so that's taken care of. All right, let's carry on here. Um, Hugh has a follow-up question about the nystagmus question. Is dalfampridine of any use for SCA6? Most of its usefulness has been demonstrated for episodic ataxia, and there are certain mutations in the gene that's involved in SCA6 that um, are episodic, and can be calmed down by the use of dalfampridine. Um, we've also found that SCA27B seems to be very sensitive to the benefits of dalfampridine. Um, but even if you're not having episodic features, but having dizziness um, and imbalance, it's worth a try. Then Sheila has a question. Have there been any reports that cerebellar ataxia has been caused by the COVID-19 vaccine? And are there any known treatments for loss of balance caused by cerebellar ataxia? Now the COVID-19 vaccine um, you know, does have some potential immediate side effects right after getting the vaccination. Most vaccines you know, can have a risk of setting up an inflammatory change, which may affect balance, may cause dizziness. And I don't know specifically about the current level of side effects of obtaining the vaccine. And that's something I would have to go back and look up. And I'm sure that there are websites that, that will give us a running uh, tally of, of the number of side effects related to the vaccine. Um, we know that there could be risks for the heart and other areas as well. Now, um, Jessica, as an interesting question, there's a chiropractor in her area that does umbilical cord stem cell transplants, trying to decide if it would benefit her to try that. Um, are there some known pros and cons of stem cell treatment in SCA3? Are there different kinds of stem cell therapies that are more effective than others? All the appropriate stem cell programs are being done under research projects. So um, Steminent, based in Taiwan, has been working on a stem cell infusion to stimulate nerve growth factors and improve symptoms and potentially slow progression of SCA2 and SCA3. They have not yet come to the United States. Um, there is a stem cell project out of the Mayo Clinic in the United States, which is for non-genetic ataxia. Um, and you know the debate about umbilical cord stem cells, stem cells derived from other um, you know procedures or areas is ongoing. Um, so that you know I would not advise pursuing stem cells outside of a research program at this time. Now, uh, Mr. Gallego um, has a question about um, investigations. For SCA3, um, Celos, tririliazole, and others. You know, I think one of the more frustrating things over the past year um, has been, you know, a lot of interest in the pipeline for SCA3 and the other SCAs on the National Ataxia Foundation website, but the slowness in getting these programs going. So for SCA3, we initially had the Biogen um, gene blocker study which was um, placed on hold because of concerns that there could be side effects at higher doses. The CELOS intravenous trehalose program is also paused right now. They've had some very good data for its use in ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, but they do need to get additional funding to continue their program in SCA3. Troriliazole is currently being um, data reanalyzed and presented to the FDA with a hope that it will be approved. Um, I think troriliazole has shown that there is benefit for SCA3 in the two trials that have been completed so far. Um, and currently, Biohaven is planning on opening up 
an expanded access program for Torreliazole for anybody diagnosed with a genetic spinocerebellar ataxia. And I just confirmed this this morning with them that you have to get it from a site that has been involved with their Torreliazole research. You don't have to have been involved in the original studies and you don't necessarily have to have one of the common spinocerebellar ataxias so that somebody with spinocerebellar ataxia type 17 or type 36 or all the way up to spinocerebellar ataxia type 50 with a documented genetic diagnosis could through one of the research sites apply for the expanded access of drugs that are not yet approved for ataxia, but you know do have some evidence from European studies and some of the studies done here, troriliazole or regular riliazole and dalfampridine or four aminopyridine are at the top of the list of things that can be tried for symptomatic benefit. Now, Mark has a question, could you recommend a drug for speech improvement? So if it's a taxic speech, then potentially any of the medicines that we've mentioned that seem to be symptomatically helpful for ataxia could help speech. Riliazole, troriliazole, if you have access to it, potentially dalfampridine. If your speech is compromised because of upper motor neuron involvement or tightness, then medications, you know, baclofen, um, which is used for spasticity, and low-dose Prozac um, has been used off-label for a tight speech or tight swallowing. So there are definitely medications that can be used. If your speech is compromised by too much saliva, there's medications to help control saliva. Um, so, you know, it's important, I think, to work with a speech therapist on non-drug strategies and then you know get their advice about medications they have may, may have seen that have been helpful. Um, Howard has a question about what vitamins do I recommend for ataxia? Um, if you have a well-balanced diet that isn't restricted in any particular area and includes you know the green you know greens and you know enough protein and enough healthy carbs and healthy oils, you may not need vitamin supplements. There are certain vitamins or supplements that may help with fatigue. And the ones that my patients have talked about, um, CoQ10 can help with fatigue. Um, fish oil has a very good um, standing in the anti-aging um, category. So that if you wanted to try a fish oil supplement, you know, could see how that does. Um, and then there are a variety of Chinese herbs um, and lion's mane, I think is a popular one right now that people say may help with fatigability and performance. But any vitamins that you are taking, you need to discuss with your doctor um, because some vitamins do interact with prescribed drugs. Some prescribed drugs may affect your vitamin levels. So if you're thinking of starting a vitamin, um, you know, look at some of the things that other people are saying seem to be helpful, clear it with your doctor, start one vitamin at a time, and maybe carry it on for three months and decide if it's helping or not. Now, Mary Ellen has a very interesting research question. Would you explain why CRISPR is not appropriate treatment for ataxia? So CRISPR technology um, works in a Petri dish, works in a test tube, has been done in some animal studies and has been done for disorders of peripheral tissues as opposed to brain tissues. And what the CRISPR technologies do is they're like molecular scissors and they can snip out a mutation that could then allow the DNA to make RNA and ultimately make a protein um, at proper levels that is a normal protein. And this is the way it's done you know, in the lab on, on the lab bench. Um, delivering CRISPR um, to the brain or delivering it to any part of the body um, where you're going to manipulate DNA and then, you know, the DNA in the case of a blood disease, you could, you know, the blood is constantly reproducing itself. You could CRISPRize, you know, the DNA in, in the bone marrow and it will begin making normal blood-related proteins. 
the brain cells though, um, you know, are, are pretty stable, you know, once they're there, once they develop and, and, you know, hook up and make all their connections, you know, in early childhood, um, you know, to adolescence, you know, pretty much they're there until they start dying off. So that using a CRISPR to try to backtrack to snip out a mutation in a nerve pathway or a nerve cell pathway that is already damaged or compromised may not result in improvement. Um, and this is about as much as I know about CRISPR, but it depends on the tissue that you're targeting with it. Now, there may well be other therapies that can um, be used, um, you know, potentially in the brain to, um, you know, alter, you know, the um, production of the bad protein, hence the gene blocking therapies that, that we have talked about. Um, where rather than trying to rearrange the DNA, you block it from making messenger RNA and from making the abnormal protein. Um, or if you're missing a protein, there may be epigenetic strategies that within a nerve cell that is deficient in a certain protein that's causing ataxia, you can use treatments to turn the gene on so that it begins to make protein properly. Um, but CRISPR is, you know, very, very early in its use in, in human disease. So we'll, we'll keep our eyes open for further research. Kathy has a question. Is dystonic posturing common in spinocerebellar ataxia? Um, and how long do, and I do not know, epizodesmin last. I don't know what that word means. Um, and it's either a word I'm going to have to look up or, or maybe there was a little typo there. But dystonic posturing can be seen in many of the ataxias, ataxia type 2, type 3, um, and some of the recessive ataxias, so that um, it would be treated like any dystonia. Um, there are plenty of medications that we've learned about from our movement disorders colleagues that could be used to reduce dystonic posturing, as well as physical therapy techniques to try to relax the, the posturing abnormality. Patricia has a question. Is it true that SCA2 that starts later in life will progress more slowly? That is an excellent question. Now, with Friedreich's ataxia, which is a protein deficiency disease, later in life onset means you're making a little bit more protein than somebody with early onset, and that could slow progression. With the spinocerebellar ataxias like type 2, type 3, that have what's called a gain of function, where there's a mutation that results in the production of an abnormal protein, which is then damaging to the nerves. You know, there's been debate, you know, smaller mutation, less abnormal protein being produced, later onset of symptoms, but will that mean that it will progress more slowly? Or once the starter switch is on for the disease onset, it then progresses at about the same rate. Um, I, I, I think it's an area that we still need more natural history information about. I know that very early onset ataxias that come on in the teenage years or even childhood do progress more rapidly than the typical adult onset ones, but the very late onset ones I don't know how the progression stacks up and that's where the natural history data will give us more insight. Vishal has a question. Um, could I share some insights on SCA12? SCA12, as I remember it, and I, I don't think I've ever had a case here at UCLA, is associated with tremor. That's one of its major symptoms. Um, his mother has been having an issue with her balance while walking and speaking. She's 60 years old. Besides that, she's doing good overall. So SCA12 um, isn't like the typical SCA1, 2, 3s, the ones that we're most familiar with. Um, it does have prominent tremor as part of it. And I would imagine that the problems with balance, you know, with walking and coordination of speaking, would have a good response 
to physical therapy, speech therapy, and potentially some of the symptomatic medications that we've already mentioned, Riliazole, Troriliazole, um, uh, some of the medications used for speech, and certainly if tremor is part of the interference in walking and speaking, there are many anti-tremor drugs that could be tried. Um, John has a question about mitochondria condition, and I, I suspect that might be mitochondrial conditions. We know that there are separate DNA packets. There are separate genetic factors within the mitochondria that are the little energy factories that live within all of our cells. They produce energy that then supplies energy to the nerve cells, muscle cells, heart cells, and, and any cell that requires energy in the body. So a mutation in the DNA in the mitochondria itself disables the mitochondria so that it doesn't make energy and can lead to progressive problems in the nervous system, um, in the heart, in muscle, any area that depends on a ready supply of energy. Now, many of the um, factors that produce protein that supply the mitochondria so they can continue to function are normal DNA that's in, you know, in our normal genome, our normal um, body areas, so that some mitochondrial disorders are caused by mutations outside the mitochondria, like Friedreich's ataxia, um, makes the frataxin protein, which is critical for mitochondrial performance, and it's you know coded and made by regular DNA, not mitochondrial DNA. Um, many disorders that you wouldn't think affect mitochondria, and that includes many of the spinocerebellar ataxias, can have secondary damage in mitochondria. So if you look at somebody with spinocerebellar ataxia type three, you know, where you know there's a buildup of an abnormal protein um, that's damaging the nerves, ultimately there can be secondary damage to the mitochondria in those nerve pathways that will then add damage to the, the neurologic process that's going on. So my thought is that anything that improves mitochondrial function could be helpful in most of the ataxic disorders. And that would be antioxidant vitamins. And there are many that if you Googled antioxidant vitamin, there would be many of them that, that probably don't do much, but, but some that are recognized to be helpful, like CoQ10 would be one that I would consider trying. Um, and then Cindy has a question. Do I prescribe chlorzoxazone for nystagmus? I haven't. Um, I don't know. I would have to look that up. I know I have colleagues who are using it. Um, Joanne has a question an undefined spinocerebellar ataxia with a lot of muscle pain in one leg as well as some swelling. Is this unusual? Um, she's had the ultrasound and circulatory testing and fortunately no blood clot. Um, muscle pain in spinocerebellar ataxia is relatively common either because the ataxia is contributing to muscle overuse um, and you can get muscle pain on that basis, sprain and strain kind of pain. Um, the swelling usually implies that there is a peripheral neuropathy also present. So if we think the pain and swelling is from peripheral neuropathy, there are certainly treatments that can help that physical therapy as well as medication. Um, excuse me, there's another knock at my door. Hang on. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm aware of that prescription. I put it in care. Oh, um, uh, for what? For the, the prescription for chicken. Okay. Okay. Let me look it up again. Okay. Yeah, not under charge. Okay. All right. I'm back. It's my patient who's having a procedure who needs a prescription signed. So let me look that up so that she can proceed with her prescription and get her procedure done. Let's see. All right, not there. And let's look here. The electronic medical record is 
very convenient, but if you're not a maven of how to use the internet, it can be a little challenging. Um, all right, let's see. Not finding it. All right, I'm going to let them know that I'm having a little trouble finding that prescription to sign. Um, and then we can carry on. So I will probably get another knock on my door and we will find this prescription so we can sign it for that patient. Um, so again, muscle pain and swelling, think peripheral neuropathy and, and have that screened for and treat it appropriately. Is sleep apnea a symptom of SCA2? Sleep apnea, disordered sleep cycle in general can be seen with any of the ataxias. Um, certainly, in coordination of throat muscles, in coordination of breathing during sleep can lead to sleep apnea. Um, it can also lead to um, snoring, which can be bothersome, but not necessarily dangerous, and other sleep-related disorders. So if you wake up in the morning feeling like you haven't slept, if you're exhausted during the day, Sleep apnea could be disturbing your nighttime sleep and absolutely should be screened for and treated. Now, Sylvia has a question. I've heard a lot about, um, I think this is Ampira. Um, will it help? And we've talked about dalfampridine, which is the generic form of Ampira that has a track record of helping with dizziness, helping with nystagmus, and also helping with ataxia. So it is worth trying under a doctor's supervision. Um, its initial approval was for multiple sclerosis to help with walking and balance. Um, so if you don't have MS, it may be hard to get your insurance to authorize it. But with a coupon from, for instance, GoodRx, you can actually get a month's supply for under $50. And it's not cheap, but it's, it would give you a, enough of a head start to at least try it. And will CBD help ataxia? Um, CBD has a variety of uses in medical practice. It's used for um, sleep disorders. It's used for certain cramping and spasm disorders. There's a lot of off-label use. Um, I have not heard that it is helpful actually for ataxia. So if you're using it for a sleep-related problem or a pain-related problem, you know, make sure it's not making your ataxia worse. Um, but, you know, most of the time it'll help these other symptoms and may or may not, you know, help your ataxia in the end. Angela has a question, is HSP or hereditary spastic paraplegia and SPG7 the same? They are classified as the spastic paraplegias um, or the spastic ataxias. So HSP includes many subgroups. SPG7 is one of them and is a fairly common cause of genetic ataxia. So Sunny Marple has a question. What are the main benefits and symptoms you've been seeing with Sky Claris? Um, this is a terrific question. Um, you know, we're uh, over a year from its FDA approval and, you know, about nine months into its availability for the Friedreich's ataxia community. So when you look at the research results of Skyclaris, which um, activates mitochondria so that they can push back against oxidative stress or free radical stress, what they saw in the studies in the initial six months, there was an improvement in symptoms, primarily standing and walking in the people who participated in the trial, but to some extent, upper extremity coordination. Now, since you know, we've been using it um, in the general population, many of whom are not ambulatory, are wheelchair dependent, 
I have had people say early on, speech is better, hand coordination is better, trunkal control is better, um, energy levels are better. And the side effects have been minimal and, and you know, lasting just, you know, a few weeks. So I've been very happy with its use in Friedreich's ataxia. Potentially, it could be helpful for other mitochondrial disorders or disorders where the mitochondria are affected, as we already spoke about before. And it's not clear if Biogen is going to be looking at studies in other diseases at this time. Now, Jerry says he has an acquired ataxia due to a stroke in the cerebellum um, about two years ago. Is this lifelong or will it get better or will it get worse? So with a stroke um, or a brain injury that you recover to a certain extent from, and there's always recovery in the first couple of years, and Jerry should be in that recovery phase now, um, it should stabilize. It may never completely recover, and it depends how much damage there was in the cerebellum. But over the one to two years after a stroke, good physical therapy and a good home exercise program will optimize recovery. Now, once you have a recovered area, um, the permanently damaged nerves have not come back. It's other nerve pathways that are filling in and kind of taking over for the permanently damaged nerves. Now, our brains age. Aging begins after the age of 30. So that what appears to be a stable recovery from a stroke, as brain aging carries on, you might find some increasing symptoms as some of those recovered nerve pathways age out. Um, we see this in children who have had strokes and recovered. There's a, a post-stroke syndrome in that case. We have you know, patients who have had Guillain-Barre syndrome and recovered, and then 15 or more years later begin to decline again because those recovered nerves are aging out. And the same thing with polio survivors, that you know, people who recovered from polio with certain deficits or no deficit at all, as the brain ages, those recovered pathways might age out. So, you know, I would think positively now because we're in the first few years of recovery. And if there is going to be a future deterioration, it probably won't occur, you know, before 15 or 20 years down the road. Now, here's a question from Colleen um, about ataxia telangiectasia, which is a recessively inherited disorder um, of an important protein that's involved in DNA repair. And we are constantly supervising and repairing DNA. Um, you know, the, the DNA, even in the brain, which is a stable tissue, which isn't making more brain cells, but the DNA has to open up, make protein, close up, do its normal job. And if small defects occur in that DNA, then it's going to become damaged. It won't be able to do its job and it will result in the symptoms that we see in, for instance, ataxia telangiectasia. There is a lot of research going on. Um, there's the Eridel study, which is now the Quince study, where they take red blood cells, put a steroid in them, dexamethasone, reinfuse your red cells back into you, carrying this drug in them. And then the blood cells circulate and distribute the drug throughout the nervous system and the body um, at safe levels that seem to have a benefit symptomatically in ataxia telangiectasia. But it's mainly seen in the younger patients before the age of 10. Now there's the intrabio study um, of an, an amino acid supplement that has been approved in Europe for um, dizziness and has been used for ataxia that is being tested in ataxia telangiectasia still. There's another company with another um, you know, kind of metabolic supplement that is looking to begin a clinical trial in AT specifically. And I'm actually going to be talking with them later this week about that. Um, so there is a lot of research going on for symptomatic drugs as well as potentially protective drugs. Now, the tremors you describe, um, internal tremors, um, you know, getting really strong, most 
tremors that we see in ataxia telangiectasia and the other ataxias are visible on the outside so that there'll be hand tremors or truncal tremors, um, which usually respond very well to amantadine um, as a tremor agent that I've used in some of my ataxia telangiectasia patients. The internal tremors, I don't know how to interpret them, um, but it might be worth a trial of amantadine, um, just as a thought, something to discuss with your local doctor. Now here, Beverly um, had cataract surgery and her eyes got worse. She gets very dizzy. Is there something that she can take? Now, if we think the worsening in the eyes and the dizziness relates to nystagmus, We've already mentioned some medications used for nystagmus. And as I said, the National Taxi Foundation has uh, you know, several fact sheets. One of them includes a list of medications that can be used to help eye movement abnormalities that are related to dizziness. Deborah um, says two of her adult children have tested positive for SCA2. Will they definitely show symptoms or will they possibly only become carriers? If you have a mutation in the gene, one copy of the gene for SCA2 that's in the range that is known to cause symptoms, they will ultimately show symptoms, sometimes later in life, as we discussed previously, um, depending on the size of the mutation. There are gray zone mutations for many of these genes where it's not clear that they will ever show symptoms in the patient. Um, but when they're passed on to the next generation, if the mutation gets a little bigger, could cause symptoms in, in the next generation. So knowing the size of the mutation for SCA2 or the other SCAs, and if it's in a symptomatic range that will ultimately cause symptoms, or if it's in a what's called a gray zone that may never cause symptoms, but does provide a risk for the next generation, is something you can discuss with your genetic counselor. Um, you know, here Danny says, um, has been diagnosed with SCA43 and recently visited with Dr. Dubinsky, who's a wonderful physician. Um, not clear what um, Dr. Dubinsky's treatment plan is. Um, SCA43, as you can tell from the numbered series, is one of the more recently found um, SCAs. Shirley says, I have SCA7 um, and is doing hopefully proper diet and exercise. And are there any non-drug ways to relieve symptoms? Um, certainly for coordination and balance, physical therapy, for dizziness, you can do vestibular therapy, which will also help. Um, for the vision problems per se with SCA7, um, you know, there are vitamin supplements that help strengthen the, the, the eye, the eye nerves, the retina. Um, but I, we always come back to, to physical therapy. Now, um, does anesthesia have an adverse effect on the cerebellum? These days, fortunately, anesthetic agents and the anesthesiologists who administer them are very careful, you know, with how they proceed. You know, they're monitoring, you know, for any positive bad effects that might occur during the procedure that the anesthesia is being done in. And I think the only damage I've seen from anesthesia is people who have undergone prolonged anesthesia, hours of anesthesia, um, or who have had multiple general anesthetic things within a short period of time, within a year. Um, you know, the, these are drugs, you know, they circulate, they could have an impact on the cerebellum with a normal anesthetic procedure, short in, in length and given, you know, once once in a year, there shouldn't be any adverse effect on the cerebellum. So Sheila, what are the first steps for ataxia treatment? Valence and vestibular therapies have not worked. Okay, so we've established that my go-to first steps, you know, in this individual have not been successful. But her doctor has prescribed dalfampridine, absolutely worth trying, followed by riliazol, um, which is also worth trying. Um, and if you have a um, genetically identified spinocerebellar ataxia, you may be eligible to obtain um, troriliazol um, through the expanded access program. And then trazodone 50 milligrams at night. 
So you have to be careful with trazodone. Sometimes it lingers in your system. You can feel a little hungover the next day, which is not going to help your ataxia. But I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to see that you're um, being able to try dalfampridine. Um, Mary has a question. Do I have any update on the Troriliazole review? No. I was just talking with the people um, at Biohaven this morning, and you know we're still waiting to hear what the FDA is going to do with that. Now, Anna Maria, um, patient with uh, spinal cerebellar ataxia sporadic, 41 years old, symptoms started at age 16 with a lack of balance. Lumbar puncture at 17 and 18 years of age was normal. MRI shows brain atrophy and thin looking blood vessels. And I, I don't know quite what to make of that. No cardiac problems. EMG does show a polyneuropathy. Um, so there is a peripheral neuropathy. No medical history that could be influencing this. And genetic testing for Friedreichs is negative. So the next step I would do with early onset ataxias, um, I would absolutely pursue further genetic testing. Many of the early onset ataxias will show up on whole exome sequencing. Um, they have a mutation that will show up. Friedreichs won't show up on whole exome sequencing, but many of the others will. And I think that would be an important next step. And then a step beyond that, would be to look for some of the more common adult ataxias that could come on in a younger person, ataxia type one, two, three, et cetera, that will again, not show up on whole exome sequencing, but can be studied on their own separate panel. Danny, are there any specific exercises I can do to help with um, balance and coordination? The key ones that are helpful um, first of all, if you have weakness or muscle tightness, strengthening and stretching exercises will always help. But the main focus in physical therapy and a home exercise program is core strength, cardio, rhythmic, repetitive exercise, and simple balance exercises, and some combination of those that you can do. Are there any clinical trials ongoing for Scott 12 now? Okay. I'm not aware of any trials, but we can always look that up. On the other hand, the um, expanded access program of troriliazole will include people with SCA-12 if they can um, obtain it through one of the research sites. Mona has a question. What causes people with ataxia to get double vision? It's either in coordination of the eye movements, for instance, nystagmus, that tremor that can present and may cause double vision, or it's involvement in the nerves in the brainstem that control eye movement, um, you know, basically syncing the eye movement so the eyes work together. If the eyes are not working together because the brainstem connections have been altered by your ataxia, then you will have double vision. So it could either come from the cerebellum itself or it could come from the brainstem. Um, in my case, this happened all of a sudden some years after I had been diagnosed. Okay, that is interesting. Typically, the eye movement problems come on fairly early um, in the course of ataxia. Um, so the double vision presenting late is a little unusual. And I would suspect that your ataxia began in the cerebellum, didn't have much influence on the vision. But later on, as the cerebellar connections to the brainstem began to weaken, the brainstem may now have become involved. Um, and this is absolutely worth seeing a, a good neuro-ophthalmologist to try to unravel what's going on and if there's going to be a better treatment for it. So Linda has a question about dalfampridine. We've already addressed that in a couple of other scenarios um, that um, it has been used in Canvas. Um, and this person does have Canvas, the RFC1 mutation. Um, so for dizziness, which can occur in canvas, for ataxia, which can occur in canvas, it's a very reasonable drug to try. Potential side effects, if you overdose on it, um, as it were, um, or combine it with another drug that could have a similar side effect in lowering the seizure threshold, ultra high doses may, may pro, uh, make people prone to seizures. So if you already have a seizure problem, I wouldn't advise using it or use it at a much lower dose and check with its interactions with any other medications. 
Now, other medications that look promising in clinical trials, Canvas has a very active research group in Europe and in North America that is looking for ways to get into that genetic mutation to modify it to improve symptoms and slow disease progression. So this is a case of stay tuned. Now, Hugh has a question. Is urinary urgency and frequency common with SCA6? It can be common with most of the ataxias. The muscles that control the sphincters that you know control our bladder being able to empty and hold urine need coordination like any muscle would. So urinary urgency and frequency are fairly common in all of the SCAs. Now, if you also have peripheral nerve involvement or upper motor neuron involvement, that can also impact the bladder, could make the bladder tighter and more liable to fire off more frequently, or could make the bladder more relaxed, retaining urine, which is harder to control. So it's worthwhile if you're having these symptoms, discuss them with your primary care doctor and consider meeting with a urologist if you feel medication would, would be helpful. Now, Sue says, I have cerebellar ataxia with chronic cough. Ooh, um, Canvas, RFC1, has been associated with chronic cough. So I'm wondering if you've been screened for that. Now, I started gabapentin, which my neurologist suggested. Haven't noticed a difference. May to, need to increase the amount. Yes, you always start low and go slow. Do I have any experience with chronic cough? So number one, neurogenic cough is a, a prominent feature of Canvas syndrome. Um, chronic cough can result from things totally unrelated to your ataxia. You know, maybe you've got, you know, some uh, tendency to have uh, asthma related reactions, allergic reactions, post nasal drip. If you have acid reflux that is, you know, coming up without necessarily causing heartburn, but irritating the throat, that can give you a chronic cough. If your swallowing is ataxic, and you have food or liquid that's going down you know, the wrong pipe or lingering in your throat and then jumping into your airway, that can cause a chronic cough. So I hope that your chronic cough has been evaluated for any of these causes. And you know, definitely give the gabapentin a, a little more trial, maybe at a higher dose. Fred is asking a question about Frankel's exercises, which were exercises that were developed um, and used by physical therapists when I was first beginning in the ataxia field to improve coordination and balance. If you have a therapist who's still using the Frankel exercises, absolutely try them. They do seem to help. Now, um, Sheila has an interesting question. What are my thoughts on small doses of chlorine um, dioxide or hyperbaric oxygen treatments for loss of balance? Um, I suspect they are not helpful. I know many people will take oxygen treatments to help with fatigability, but you know the the circulation and oxygen supply to your cerebellum, you know, if you don't have a, a problem in your lungs so that you're not oxygenating properly, if you haven't had an injury where healing is is going to be compromised, you know, their hyperbaric oxygen or oxygen supplementation can be helpful. Um, but regarding their specific use in garden variety cerebellar ataxia, I have not heard that it is helpful. Christina has a question. Why is genetic ataxia clumped with acquired? Um, and she has had strokes, um, you know, 10 or so years ago. I can relate with some of the experiences for sure, but similarly with Parkinson's and many other disabilities. So you're right. Genetic ataxia, which damages the cerebellum, acquired ataxias, which damage the cerebellum as with stroke, as we previously discussed, share a common factor. There's damage in the cerebellum that the cerebellum needs to be stimulated to work better, um, to do its job better. The treatments for the underlying problem, you know, genetic treatments, um, you know, treatments to prevent, you know, another stroke or other acquired problems are going to be very different but symptomatic treatment can benefit both genetic and acquired ataxia. Oh, Mary has a question. Have I heard of dihexa? I have not heard of it. It's gonna go on my list of things that I will look up at some point and hopefully be able to discuss with you in the future. Do I know if or when the ataxia results of celosis IV trehalose are coming? 
As I mentioned, the trial in spinal cerebellar ataxia type 3 has been paused, but there was data that came out of their trial for Lou Gehrig's disease, which was very positive. So that data is available online. I think the data for the small number of patients that have been participating in the CELOS trial for SCA3, you know, they're going to be looking at that data, but they haven't yet analyzed it. And it's a very small number of patients um, that were able to get into the initial, initial study. Julie has a, another good question. Any information on SCA45? I am 64 diagnosed with this progressive ataxia and it seems more aggressive than her two siblings or the two siblings that she's been told about in the Netherlands. I don't know, I'm going to have to look up. The fact that it has a high number um, means that it's more, more recently described. There's gonna be fewer patients and families that have been identified with it. So you know, being able to predict its natural history may be hard at this point, but I'll see if I can find out more information about it. Can breast cancer due to calcium buildup and blindness be a possible occurrence associated with SCA6? I have not heard that association at all. I do not believe that they are associated. Um, SCA6 may have nystagmus, may have double vision, may have dizziness from you know, eye-related symptoms, but not blindness. Have I heard of anyone making improvements with high-dose B1 supplements? Well, Friedreich Titaxia, there was high-dose B1 supplementation that was used, had a small study, and many people were trying it. If you've had a B1 deficiency um, from any one of a number of causes, B1 supplementation at high dose can be helpful. I've heard people say that B vitamins in general can be helpful with fatigability. Um, so there, there are some people who have benefited from it. And I think we have time for one or two more questions and I have to check back to see what happened to that prescription for my patient having her procedure today. Um, how would I treat neuropathy in ataxia? Um, if it's due to the genetic defect, um, then you manage it with physical therapy to try to keep the nerve muscle connectivity going. If it's mainly a sensory neuropathy um, that is causing numbness or pain, there are medications that can be used. Gabapentin is one that can be helpful with that. Um, and making sure that your diet, your exercise program um, you know, nutritional supplements are healthful and you're not overdoing it with, for instance, vitamin B6, which can actually worsen neuropathy. And let's try one, uh, one more question. See if I can find one a little further down. Um, I had neuropathy gene panel, came back with a mutation in a particular gene that I would have to look up diagnosed with polyneuropathy and ataxia unknown. Is ataxia just hereditary or do I need to do anything else? If you've had a genetic factor that came back positive and has been associated with ataxia, not just neuropathy, which can cause balance problems, but actual ataxia, um, then the, that genetic test may be your answer to what's going on. On the other hand, if the genetic factor is associated with neuropathy, but hasn't been reported to affect the cerebellum, then you should do further studies to look for other factors that could be affecting the cerebellum, you know, acquired factors, for instance. Um, and I think I'm going to have to stop here. Um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get through everybody's questions, but these are wonderful questions that should be open for discussion in any of the um, you know, online chat groups that people participate in. I think we can learn as much from each other as you can from purported experts in, in these areas. Absolutely. Those are some fantastic questions that we got today. There were some additional links that was posted in the chat, uh, such as to our support group. So check out the chat. Um, real quick, but I know Dr. Perlman, you have to go. Thank you so much for answering so many questions today. And we'll look forward to the next Ask, Ask the Expert session. Very good. Take care then. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.